Hi guys, it's Mathieu Jacomi, and today I'm going to be talking about visual network analysis and basically what is the process of analyzing a network visually. And by that I mean that if you don't know what you're supposed to look at in a network map and why we would visualize a network, that's my, my basic point today. My entry point into this discussion is going to be something Mark Smith said, we lose the crowdness of the crowd when it happens online. And that is in part because we don't have a camera to take a picture of it, but we could build one. And of course, Node Excel is that kind of device that allows you to see an online crowd. And basically it could be other things. I'm gonna focus on visualization. So what I'm gonna say here uh, might be a way to visualize other phenomena that, that, that are not necessarily uh, digital like ecosystems or whatever. But I think that the, the metaphor or the case of, um, of uh, online media is going to work very well. Also because I think Twitter is a, is a data source that most of us have practiced with. But let's come back to images because that's about seeing. What does it mean to see a Twitter crowd? Images are not always what we think they are. And it's important in a science setting to be able to understand how they are constructed in order to use them efficiently. So I'm gonna start with that question. What do you see? Hold on to your answer. I'm gonna come back to that. But for the moment, I'm going to jump to another planet, Mars, with this picture of the Curiosity rover. And I have a question for you again. Who took the picture? What do you think? Maybe you think it was curiosity itself. So if you think it was a Martian selfie, then I wonder where is the arm or the stick that you usually see when you look at a selfie? Because of course, somehow the camera has to be attached to the body uh, of, of the rover, right? And if you look closely, you will see no arm. So is it really a selfie? The answer is, that it is indeed a selfie, but the picture has not been produced how you think it was, because there was never the standpoint from which you see the rover in this picture. Instead, there were a multitude of smaller uh, snapshots that were later on assembled and stitched by an algorithm, exactly the same way your smartphone is able to, to stitch a panorama. And of course, when the camera was looking left, the arm was on the right and vice versa. So when the algorithm ended up by stitching all of that, the arm was never to be, to be seen, to be found. So if we get back to this picture of Earth, we can see that somehow it's the same. The standpoint from which it was taken that you may have thought was a satellite or somewhere from space, this standpoint doesn't exist. For instance, because you wouldn't see clouds. So the, the Earth is never like that. You always have clouds. But at the same time, this is a pretty compelling picture of Earth if what you search for is um, looking at the, at the coastlines. Basically, the standpoint from which it was taken is a multitude of smaller standpoints that have been convoked to composite this image that never existed as a whole. And it's the same for networks. But I want to talk about the ways in which you can be misled and what you would do with that. And my basic premise here is that we use network visualization to find groups and build our own understanding of the data on top of groups. So what do I mean by group? I mean by group the kind of things you see here, but let's first talk about this image and what we do actually see. It's a famous picture from a famous paper called Divided Day Blog by Adamic and Glantz. And they studied the US political blogosphere before the 2004 election of Bush Jr. versus Kerry. And it was a time where Twitter and Facebook were not as dominant as today, and it was more about the blogs. So what you see here is the nodes or the vertices of the networks are the blogs, and the arrows represent the hyperlinks. And you have a layout algorithm that has been used to place the nodes in the space of the screen. And it has placed the nodes, as generally is the case, so that the connected nodes are closer. And you have independently from that, the colors that uh, represent the political affiliation of the blocks. This is like a manual tagging. So of course you have in blue the Democrats and in red the Republicans. 
And so you, you see actually two things. You see two clusters, one on the left and one on the right, and you see two colors, the blue and the red. And I'm going to overlook a few other details like the, the yellow edges. So basically, what you're supposed to understand in this image is that because the placement of the nodes and the color are independent, it's remarkable that they do correspond, that they do correlate. Because if you look closely, you will see that there are a few red among the blue and a few blue among the red. But basically, the right cluster is red and the left cluster is blue. This means that the blue nodes tend to connect more with other blue nodes, which means that Democrat blogs tend to link other Democrat blogs more than Republican blogs, and of course, vice versa. We could also do other things like looking at the size of these clusters, looking at their density and other things. Once you have these groups that you can identify and understand, there's a lot of things that you can do. But the paper became famous because for the first time, we could see the famous polarization of the US politics, a phenomenon we knew about, but there were not many pictures of that. Now, to be fair, um, Adamic and Glenn's provide their evidence with a figure. So this is just an illustration. And it might be the way they have found their findings, but it's not meant in the paper as a piece of evidence. They have statistics to assess that. So let's go back to the principle because it's so important. You get a network and then you are going to try to see whether they have groups or not, assertive groups, clusters. So groups of nodes that are more connected together you're going to do that with a layout. And there are algorithms too, but I'm going to talk about that later on. And you may want to explain what these groups are by using colors that come from an attribute. So you're going to map a node attribute as a color on your nodes. And then when you have both at the same time, the layout and the colors, then you, different things may happen. They may correlate or they may not correlate. If they don't correlate, it means that you're going to have a mix of colors in each cluster. In that case, it means that the attribute is independent of how the, the nodes link to each other. But if they do match, it means that your attribute explains or is explained by the behavior that leads certain nodes to connect to other nodes. Because remember, the layout, the position of the nodes translates the topology and the colors translate an attribute that will often be what we call a ground truth. This picture, the divided day block picture, became super famous and circulated in the media and in other papers. It was a very, it's a very successful story of how um, a computational social science in, in the very beginning could talk to people in various ways. There is a very nice paper by Brooke Foucault-Wells and Isabel Merias about the circulation of that paper. But if you just look at the other paper who, who cites um, divided day blog, you were going to find a lot and a lot of these two clusters, one blue, one red. Sometimes it's even the same data set, but sometimes it's not. And you will still find this, this imprint of the original picture in the brains of all these authors, kind of as a landmark of what network science or network analysis can do for you. Now, I want to emphasize that this case is very special because it's, it's an almost caricatural case. We do have two very strongly divided clusters and we know very well what they are, but that's not what you would see in, a, in, in, in different situations. And basically, if you're going to do that yourself, you're going to see other kinds of topologies. The general shape of your network tells you something about the structure of the social relations and the phenomenon you are studying. Now, I'm not going to, to go into what different network shapes are and, and what they tell you about your phenomenon. I'm going to stick to the basic level about how you would see and what you're supposed to look at in a network to understand its structure. So you may see something like that, which is a famous network. Uh, it's the neural network of a small nematode, a small worm named C. elegans from a famous paper by Watson Strogatz at the very beginning of network science. So I use the layout. I, I hit the edges, but of course, the edges are present in the form of the node placement because the node placement depends on the topology. If you look at the placement, you may not see groups. Of course, it would be nice that we have big gaps like that, and then we would be able to see the, the groups, but there are no gaps. It's like that. So we wonder, are there groups or are there no groups? What am I going to do? The thing is, 
there might be groups to some extent. And that's what you have to learn to see or understand if you want to analyze networks. The groups are not always as well divided as in divided their block. And the thing is, the layout algorithm thinks of the differences between the groups in terms of middle point to middle point. So it's stretching the network in some ways. While for us humans, we only see the groups if we have gaps. So if there are no gaps, we see things as a whole, as if it were only one group. So sometimes we are in agreement with the layout algorithm and sometimes we're not. And we have to learn to see groups through this lack of gaps, through the absence of these border to border negative spaces where we would see that there are divides. So there might be divides, but we don't see them. One technique to circumvent this basic issue of agreement we have with the algorithms is to use a technique that uh, forces divides, like community detection. It's going to give you groups that we know are basically the same as what we would see, which is why if I run community detection on this network, I can see that there is an agreement because there are uh, areas of the same colors. It's not mixed. I could almost draw the device. Now, these algorithms, uh, at least the one I used, is non-deterministic, which is not an issue. And it even allows us to see how the, the algorithm understands the structure, because you can run it multiple times. And then you would see that it's, it's not always in agreement with itself. It's hesitating, if you want. And so here you have like six renditions, and it didn't even agree on how many clusters they are. But it, it's not completely arbitrary. You can see that there is always a red cluster on the left, there is always a purple cluster on the right, and a green one on the bottom. But where the divide is, is basically different from one time to another. Intuitively, it makes a lot of sense that some of the nodes are not strongly attached to one cluster or another. They are kind of in between. And depending on how you consider the, the limit should be drawn, they may fall on one side or on the other side. That's because they intuitively belong a little bit to different clusters. And we know that very well about partitioning a network with community detection. Basically, the real outcome of these algorithms is a set of partitions that are in partial agreement. So sometimes they overlap or they correspond, and sometimes they don't. You can see on the bottom a picture from a paper by Thiago Peixoto where we see that he's built with Bayesian strategies, this consensus of partitions. And on the borders, the nodes know very well in which cluster they, they are, but in the middle, they hesitate between different clusters, which, which makes a lot of intuitive sense to us. And the same would apply to even divided day block, as you can see on top, because if you use certain strategies like stochastic block model in this case, whatever that means, sometimes the way it, it makes a, a divide is center versus periphery, which is also a valid way to, to separate the the network in two different subspaces. So it depends, and none is necessarily more valid than the other. What you just have to keep in mind is that some nodes belong to a locally assortative structure, intuitively a group, and some nodes don't, they are in between. And that is the nature of the data. It's not a failure of the algorithms. The data is ambiguous. And if you want to describe or understand it, you have to acknowledge that it's depending on the places, more or less ambiguous. Here is an example from a, a real world uh, case that happened to me and my colleagues. It's a network of websites connected by hyperlinks about literature for the youth. And basically, depending on what you look like, you have a divide that you see as horizontal on the left or vertical on the right. And it corresponds in one case uh, to kids versus teenage literature. And in the other case, to comics and other illustrated formats, as opposed to novels and uh, books without pictures in them. So of course it makes sense that there are kind of four cases in this case, but it's not as if we had four clusters. It's more like we have a double divide, one horizontal and one vertical, and it's not exactly the same thing. I'm not gonna go into the details, but this uh, could happen to you. And you can see here that the visual works very well with these competitive divides, while if you force the, the community detection algorithm to give you a number of, of clusters, it may give you one pair, um, but not the other one, because they are to some extent exclusive. So basically, you have a, the choice, and it's not either or. You can see the group 
or the groupiness structure of the network via community detection or via a force driven layout, which is the family of layouts that produces these, these kind of things. Here is the exact same network C elegance in Node Excel basic. Uh, I run here the, the two strategies. I run the placement with an algorithm known as Frischtermann Rheingold. And I run a community detection algorithm that gave us uh, three big clusters and two small ones. So you have here on the left, dark green one, then in the middle, the light blue one, and then on the right, the dark blue one, and the two other ones are the, the red and the light green. And in Node Excel, you can input these groups into the visualization uh, proactively, doing these uh, group in a box visualizations, where basically each group is in its own box. So we force the divide here between the groups, even though we know that the groups may be ambiguous. But we still do see this ambiguity because we see the connections between the groups. So here you, you can see, for instance, that the dark blue is more connected to the light blue than to the green. And the same for the green and the light blue, they are also kind of well connected. Basically, the two clusters that were the most, uh, the most disconnected, the most apart in the layout, are the less connected as we would intuitively uh, think. So different ways to reduce the topology of the networks, but it's always about translating what these edges are to understand the structure of the network. I'm not going to go too far away beyond the question of seeing groups. So to wrap up, I'm going to say what we do with these groups when we do see them. So I say groups, but of course, as we have seen, the groups do not exist as well-separated things. They sometimes exist as a continuous space where there is no place you can really divide it. And it doesn't mean that from one side to another of that space, there is no divide. Basically, there is groupiness really often, but it doesn't mean that the groups are obvious to delineate. That's an issue we have to face, and we can also understand it and, and describe it in our science work. So basically, once we have groups, we can ask a number of questions. How many there are? What is their size? We can compare them. And what do they correspond to? This is the case if we know, if we have an attribute that allows us to understand what these groups are. And sometimes we can just create this attribute ourselves by looking into the data and adding a column, an attribute to the nodes. And we can also wonder who is in the center and who is in the periphery of the group. And we can also wonder how the groups are connected and who, which nodes are connecting them. These questions all have a visual counterpart and a statistical counterpart. What I mean here is that, for instance, if you wonder who is in the center, you can use a centrality metric such as closeness centrality or just the degree of the node, the number of neighbors, and then you will get a hierarchy of nodes on top the most connected or the most central and on, and on the bottom the less connected and the less central. But we also want to know sometimes who is connecting the clusters together, who is bridging them. And you can see the bridges in the layout because, of course, they are in between. So you can find a node like this one here who is connecting some clusters to other clusters. And we could also detect that this node is a bridge by running the metric of betweenness centrality. So you can learn which uh, metrics correspond to which visual affordances. I don't have the time to get back to that, but you can find it in the paper we have written with Martin Grandjean, the reference is on the right, and I'm, I'll put the description down below. Anything you can ask about the whole network, you can ask about a single cluster and vice versa. So there is a Russian dolls nested structure to many networks with clusters, within clusters, within clusters, depending on their size. So at the end of the day, what most people will do with these strategies is visualize the network to understand it, and they will understand it in terms of groups connected together. And then on top of this understanding in, in terms of groups, they will look into other details, the central nodes, the bridging nodes, and they will compare the size and the structure of the clusters. And if they have an interesting finding, they are going to provide evidence with the statistics that correspond to their reading of the network. If it's a bridge, it's going to be net, uh, between net centrality. 
If it's a center, it's going to be something else like closeness, centrality. If it's the, the size and the density of a cluster, it can be edge density. And there are ways like that to provide evidence, for instance, that there is indeed polarization in the blogosphere in the US in 2004. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>